if we don't have water, we can live without chocolate and diamonds and Bitcoin and, 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 and gold. We can live without all of that, the caviar. We don't need any of those things. But the one thing we all need, everyone, everywhere, all the time, is access to water. Uh, a couple of days, we die as individuals, as families, as communities, as nation states. And we're seeing it already. Uh, we are seeing water wars. We're seeing city, major cities uh, that can no longer provide fresh water to the population. Uh, we've seen, uh, and this has all been exacerbated by climate. Uh, it's not going to get any better. Um, and so weather pattern changes, drought, extreme weather, rain, flood, erosion. Um, and then add on top of that a kind of history of corruption uh, and, and uh, political and, and, and financial gain uh, that has been accumulated by a few. Uh, and you have essentially a mandatory set of circumstances to which you are going to have to uh, respond and adapt immediately uh, to survive. This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with an old friend, Peter Neal. Today's uh, session is just about work that I think is, is so important to the future of this planet and to the lives of our children. Peter, thank you for joining me. Oh, it's my great pleasure, uh, Rob. Good to see you again. It's been a while. And, uh, great to see you. How, uh, I guess where I'd like to start is, is understanding how this World Ocean Observatory came to be. What, what did you see? What inspired you? And what, what have you built? Well, I was, I've been in the maritime preservation business for, for some time. It was sort of a second career. My first career was as a novelist. I published a bunch of novels in the 70s. Um, but one day I was in Cambridge. Uh, it was sleety and rainy, and I ducked into a used bookstore to uh, get out of the weather, went to the dollar bin, and I found a book called The Ocean, Our Future, which was a report uh, by an independent commission on the future of the oceans, the world oceans, it had been it had been uh, gathered together uh, experts from around the world by Mario Suarez, who was the former president of Portugal. Uh, and I sat down and read through it, and it was as if my whole life changed uh, because it's the most prescient report still. Um, and its final uh, recommendation was that there be a online. Uh, place of exchange for information and educational services about the ocean, key, key point defined as an integrated global social system. So it transcends the conventional focus on species and habitat to connect the ocean to climate, freshwater, food, energy, health, trade, transportation, science, technology, policy, governance, um, international finance, uh, and cultural traditions, uh, community development. Almost, well, everything in our lives are connected by the ocean, and it has been exaggerated even still or amplified by globalization. Um, the first person who stepped off a, a beach onto a small boat and pushed out into the unknown ocean, that was the beginning of globalization through exploration and, and knowledge and all the rest. So I, I did some due diligence about this idea. I went to see some people at the UN um, and uh, asked permission. Uh, they, they said, uh, well, we don't know who's going to do it. If you'd like to try, why not? Uh, and that was about 16, 17 years ago. Uh, and so after I left South Street, I took that with me uh, here in Down East Maine and have built a platform that uh, advocates through communication and con connection uh, toward building a community of citizens of the ocean worldwide, which uh, is an informed body uh, sort of created from the bottom up as a exercise in uh, understanding preservation and political will. Uh, one of the great problems we have in all these transformational ideas is political will. And so uh, if, we, if we're expecting that, 
necessarily to come from the top down. We already know that uh, that's a, a, a limited opportunity. Uh, the way it does happen, though, is is from the bottom up. And if that's and if that's going to happen successfully, it needs an educated public. Um, so we have these communication platforms. We have um, uh, uh, audio features, podcasts, aggregated video channel. Um, we have uh, online exhibits, profiles, educational curriculum. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, a digital magazine. We're developing a virtual aquarium. I'll talk about that maybe later. Sure. Uh, and all of these things uh, which are vehicles by which we can focus on solutions and information, responsible science information and solutions, the idea being to, to, to become a force in ocean literacy. Uh, we are uh, irresponsibly negligent in our understanding of the ocean. And science um, uh, is hard at work. Uh, data, we are learning enormous amounts every day, more and more and more. There's an old adage that we know more about the surface of, 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 of Mars than we know about the, about the ocean that represents 70% of our, of our planet. Uh, nonetheless, um, that's not the entire answer. As in all cases, data is enormously useful. There's never enough. Scientists always want more. Uh, and the idea now, though, is if we're, we, we need to turn that data into action. And uh, one of the ways we do that is, uh, is to aggregate the work, the good work of others, celebrate the work of others, bring it all together into one place uh, where people can go and uh, interact. And, you know, the website now is you know, almost three million people a year. Um, and all of these other things, uh, Facebook follow following is 950,000. Um, these are all sort of numbers that matter if you're actually going to try to reach people outside of the conventional circles uh, and silos. Um, as in all cases, we, we limit ourselves, we talk to ourselves, we have conferences uh, where we all come together and say uh, report that we've of the incremental advance that we've made since the last conference. Um, these frustrate frustrate me terribly, uh, but uh, so the World Ocean Observatory can now claim, I think, responsibly, legitimately, that we're reaching millions of people worldwide with this message uh, 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 for ocean preservation and sustainability. I think it's fascinating, just many of the different aspects and dilemmas that you brought up. As you know, in the what you might call post-Trump era, the notion of uh, expertise, hierarchy, and representation is in tatters. I don't mean the, they are wrong. I mean the, the uh, confidence in those things has been beaten up. So at some level, you have something that is bottom-up, organic, which you might call for the people on the outside. Right. But, uh, and, and I heard you say in that, that you weren't in a place where you felt like you could essentially just go to the insider committee meetings that would be taken care of. Uh, and I guess there are two questions that come to mind. Uh, one is, sometimes there's something which economists call the public good. And in a market-based system and whatever, it, it's not that we don't care, but nobody's responsible, so it falls between the cracks. The public good is not taken care of. Right. Other times, there's what you might call vested interests with fierce opposition to the repairs that are necessary for the public good because it creates private loss. You right. see a lot of this now with fossil fuel companies or nations that have huge endowments of fossil fuels, right. like Russia seemingly resisting the notion of climate change or the repair of our energy production systems. What right. do you see when it comes to the sea? Are there organized interests trying to thwart the work that you think needs to be done, number one, or is it just neglect and fall between the cracks or a little of both? Well, it's a little of both. Neglect or indifference or, or just uh, 
uh, a kind of an assumption that, that it's out there. You go to the beach, it seems infinite. Uh, you don't really see the the tumult, the, the systems that are that, that are inherent in the in the in the in in, in that, that that nature. Um, you take it for granted. Um, you, you walk down the, uh, a, a Walmart corridor and ask somebody where all this stuff come from. They have no idea that it's come from someplace else across the sea. They don't understand the interconnection of, of, of shipping or, for example, uh, uh, the exchange of data or financial transactions that take place by undersea cables. People just don't understand that this ocean atmosphere, this ocean environment is, is essential to almost everything that happens to our, our world now. Uh, climate is one part of it. Uh, 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 the, the effect of, of emissions on CO2 uh, uh, conditions, uh, the acidification of the ocean, all of these things are invisible. And, and for the most part, people don't understand them. And Sida stands up and says, well, this and that, and percentages and parts per, parts per whatever. And um, it, it's very hard for people to wrap their, their minds around it until you can um, try to make it relevant to their, to their lives specifically. Now, the vested interest thing, I mean, it's a fact of life. Yes, there's self-interest. There's also a kind of underlying psychological fear of change. It's a, it's a natural phenomenon. Nobody really wants to disrupt their lives in some way. Uh, nobody uh, in the end believes that, that they will give up something essential uh, for someone else. There's a kind of innate human self-absorption and selfishness. Um, that's, that's part of the issue. I, I don't think I can ever solve that problem. Uh, the problem is, 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 is how can you make people understand that that fear is groundless and actually that the thing that they should be afraid of is the status quo? Uh, because, and it's perfect in fossil fuels. I mean, if the smart money didn't get out of fossil fuels 10 years ago, they're not, it's not smart money. Uh, and they've ridden fossil fuels down in the name of dividend and 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 expect and and, and convention, uh, and and it, that has been further subverted by fracking, which was of course a a a, 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 a terrible uh, destructive extension of trying to get the last drop of oil out of the uh, or gas out of the ground. Uh, that had its own social ramifications. I mean, it disrupted farming. Uh, people's lands were, 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 were polluted. They, they had to move away. There's an enormous waste problem from fracking. Uh, waste, waste, fracking waste is being hidden, dumped into waterways, abandoned in places where people don't think they can see it. I mean, a horrible uh, 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 short-term attempt by the industry uh, rather than to go full into alternatives to include wind and solar, geothermal, and all the rest of it, so there's 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 that that part of it. The other part of it, though, is the the idea of understanding the commons. Uh, we've gone through a you know quite a long period of time where the idea of, of shared resources. Um, has been subverted by uh, individual gain, gr uh, 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 unlimited growth, um, essentially uh, based on consumption, enabled by fossil fuels. That was the paradigm of the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, it's, I think it's a dying paradigm, but the fact is it was there. It informed many, many people's lives. It's true that many people's lives were improved by that, until the point where the positive consequences were overcome by the negative impacts. And so it began then to, to dilute uh, and to, for people to understand that, that there is this thing called the nature's trust doctrine, for example, which says that the, the natural resources of a, of a nation belong to its people, actually. Uh, this is in, I think, uh, 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 Roman law, English common law. I think it's actually mentioned in the common constitution that these are 
these are that natural resources are an inalienable right of the people who live in the country, and it is up to government to to uh, uh, it can license that, it can develop that, but it can only do it in the context of sustainability, so that the supply is never exhausted for the ensuing generations. And of course, we have done exactly the opposite. We have gotten past peak oil to the point where now we're uh, exhausting uh, it to almost nothing. We're de desperately trying to eke out just a little bit more. Um, uh, and we're doing the same thing with water, with fresh water. Uh, we're draining the aquifers. We're polluting the water. Uh, we're doing all this kind of, of, of predictable historical behavior using structures that are like dinosaurs. They really are outmoded, outdated, um, and they're sinking into the mud. Uh, and we, we maybe some future generation will discover them and burn them. <laughs> but, but the fact is, uh, it's a paradigm that, that is, is bankrupt. Uh, yes. And so we have, uh, there is a kind of returning to, to the idea of the commons, particularly in terms of shared natural resources. And the biggest single system out there left unpolluted, uncorrupted, is the ocean. So I advocate personally and, and uh, through uh, uh, my, my, one of my books, the, the Once and Future Ocean, uh, subtitled Notes Toward a New Hydraulic Society, which is basically uh, a, a, an outcome of a new paradigm which says uh, manage growth because we're going to have to grow to meet the needs of a, of a growing population. But based on, on, on sustainability, uh, and enabled by the freshwater ocean continuum, which is the, the, the last place we can go to get the kind of energy, food, freshwater, um, uh, medicines, uh, and, and spiritual, spiritual solace uh, that have been taken away from us by bankrupt activity on land. Uh, so the idea that uh, one would transfer, transform or transition into this new paradigm uh, based on this hydraulic concept um, uh, is, is imperative. Uh, frankly, I don't see any alternative because if we don't have water, we can live without chocolate and diamonds and Bitcoin and, <laughs> and, and, and gold. We can live without all of that. The caviar. We don't need any of those things. But the one thing we all need, everyone, everywhere, all the time, is access to water. Uh, yes. A couple of days, we die as individuals, as families, as communities, as nation states. And we're mm -hmm. seeing it already. Uh, we are seeing water wars. We're seeing city, major cities uh, that can no longer provide fresh water to the population. Uh, we've seen... Uh, and this has all been exacerbated by climate. Uh, it's not going to get any better. Um, and so weather pattern changes, droughts, extreme weather, rain, flood, erosion. Um, and then add on top of that a kind of history of corruption uh, and, and uh, political and, and, and financial gain uh, that has been accumulated by a few Uh and you have essentially a mandatory set of circumstances to which you are going to have to uh, respond and adapt immediately uh, to survive. Uh, there's no time. Uh, we have lost the... Uh, I'm amazed by the lack of urgency. Uh, there is no time in, in, in terms of... Even as we set goals for, uh, you know, being fossil fuel free by 2050, 2050, 2030, uh, that's not enough. It, 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 that's too much time. It's too much time. Uh, it's, a, it's a function of, of reluctant transition. Um, and, and then what we do is we're cleaving to short-term uh, solutions. For example, the electric car. Uh, I, you know, I, 
I, I, I despair, and maybe you can help me on this, because it, to me it's a supply and demand situation. It's a fundamental economic formula that is not being talked about, which is, which is, in order to meet the, 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 the anticipated demand for electric cars and all the other uh, tools that we, will, or we propose to run off batteries, we need the rare metals to essentially build the batteries to store the power, to store the energy. And there is nowhere enough of those metals available now or in the future on the land to meet the demand. And no one seems to be talking about this. And the only place that you can go where you can expand the geological opportunity is the, is the, is the ocean floor. And mining mm -hmm. in the deep sea is already under, underway. People are trying to do it. Uh, people are fighting it. And the reason for it is that these rare metals are all located in the areas of uh, like hydrothermal vents and where the where intense biodiversity remains, which would be destroyed by this process. So all this is, is essentially taking a new technology based on extraction, wrapping it in a new kind of concept, and um, it and and seeing it as a penultimate solution, which I do I personally believe it is not. Um, mm -hmm. And so we were going, we are already seeing theft of old old in, uh, devices and catalytic converters and cars, so people can get the little bits of lithium and whatever it is that they can need because there's a market demand for them. That's pathetic. Uh, and so in order to get these 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 things, we're going to have to mine. Mining is extraction. Extraction is destructive. Uh, we've been through it all before. So why are we wasting the time on this and not looking and inventing our way out of this, not just sliding ourselves in, using the old tools, wrapping the old behaviors in new, in new clothes, uh, and inventing our way and starting to look at serious alternatives that are out there, that young, young scientists and others are uh, in are, are are working on with with some success, uh, and that's where the investment should be going. Those places are are the ones where the smart money ought to be now. And um, uh, uh, so, in order to pull this off, right? You know. Let's just you mean, you mean in order to sustain life on Earth? Oh, yeah. <laughs> One thing is simple, simple as that. Yeah. Let's, let's 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 take a look um, at the idea, the nature, the definition of capital, because that's what it all ro revolves around. It's it's capital, and we never we've always separated capital capitalism uh, uh, sort of independently uh, of understanding the true value of natural capital. And natural capital, which which are is rep the, the, the 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 gathering together of all the value of all these resources um, on Earth, um, has been uh, has been utilized, uh, but we haven't we haven't we haven't accounted for it correctly. We have, and and so I, I'd like to talk a little bit about that because. I'm not an economist. I just look at this stuff from a kind of logical, sort of uninformed point of view. But I do... You mean, you mean, you mean you're not intoxicated by the mythologies of economics? Is that what you're saying? Well, no, I mean, <laughs> I'm teasing you. Come on. you. Well, that's your job. That's your that's job. Right. That's you, right. you, you drunk the Kool-Aid. Detox. 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 That's right. <laughs> but so if you're going to pull off this hydraulic society and all the rest of it, that's fine. But what you really need to understand, and, and there's a phrase that get, describes this, which is ecosystem service analysis where you actually have to understand um, the, the, the examine and monetize all aspects of, 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 of production, manufacture, but which includes the, the, the costs 
of water, waste, uh, reparation, health effects, all of those numbers are left out of the evaluation today. We never do that. When you walk down a corridor in a supermarket and you don't hear the wasting water, you don't hear the water that was used in the packaging, the harvesting, the delivery. None of that is there. And, and, and I've, I've advocated for a labeling, water labeling. Uh, everything on earth is labeled on a package except the fact that the most important thing that was used in its manufacture is not is left out. We know about MSG or vitamin C, but we don't know about water. Everything we produce has a water cost. And it should be labeled. We should know it. Does it take a million gallons of water to build a Volkswagen? Yes. It does. Yes. Uh, and when, much of that water, by the way, is not priced and is sometimes free. So the, the, the manufacturer um, has, 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 has essentially used the primary resource at no cost and added all these other things with all their detrimental impact um, uh, on, on, on top. And we don't understand the true cost of, of all doing that, of doing that. So I would advocate in the, first ecosystem service analysis. You have to understand the problem across the full spectrum of its, of its, of its true cost. And then you have to account for it. And so why isn't there ecosystem accounting um, and audits? The, the fact is that when, you, when, when, when these companies audit their books or when they, uh, you know, calculate the, their balance sheets, um, there's this huge piece of, 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 of financial information that's not included. Mm -hmm. And if it was included at the true value, their profit would be lost. And that then would say to the investor, this is not a good strategy. We're investing in the wrong thing by not truthfully accounting for what is the, 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 the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're going to, water is now an asset class. Um, you know, there are water funds, there are water companies, there are, there are hedge funds looking for water. Oh, my God. You know, I mean, we, we just have to not let that happen again yes. so that people either um, misrepresent the true cost of things or they know and they suck out the value in the short term. Uh, and what they don't understand is that that value is irreplaceable. You 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 you, you may get a a, a a a fancier car, but you'll never get the true value of that water loss uh, uh, back again. I'm curious. Oceanographic institutes. I went to MIT when I was young. I thought about doing graduate work at Woods Hole or Scripps or any of these places. Are they at the vanguard along with you of this kind of work, or are they um, somewhat, how would I say, caught in the habit structures of previous generations or challenges? Well, I, 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 want, to, I want to give them more credit than that. Uh, Good. It, uh, that that makes these, me happy. These places, these places are doing the best science. They are, the, 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 they are out there. Um, Woods Hole is, 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 is still amazing. Uh, scripts still amazing. The the one of the problems is that they rely almost entirely on government grants. Um, you also have a, a different kind of phenomenon where you have um, something like the Schmidt uh, Ocean Institute, uh, mm -hmm. Wendy and uh, Eric and Wendy Schmidt, uh, and these are very wealthy people. Uh, they have essentially constructed a state of the art oceanographic research vessel, and they are subsidizing. Uh, scholars to go out and do amazing work in the deep sea. Um, and uh, this is essentially a kind of, it's a not-for-profit, but it's a private charity in a way um, mm -hmm. with this, this amazing intent. Uh, and so it, it obviates the, 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 
the, the structure that, for example, in a government grant, if it goes through university, anywhere from 20 to 50 or 60 percent is taken by the university as overhead. So there's this constant, uh, you know, a million dollar grant may only put $400,000 in the water uh, after all the other people have taken their 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 share. So the, the 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 structures do get in the way. There's no question about it. And scientists mm. will tell you that, that that they do. In policy, it's it's also interesting. We we use words like adapt. Uh, sea level rise is a good 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 example. Uh, uh, adapt, mitigate. You know. Well, adapt just says, well, it is what it is. We're going to have to change our ways. That's one strategy. Mitigate, it basically is a hard response, an engineering response. We're going to do some kind of, of, of thing like the Thames River Barrier or the, 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 the uh, uh, protecting barriers, uh, di uh, artificial dikes that are now protecting the coast of the Netherlands. Uh, these, these, uh, Venice is thinking about the same thing in order to, to control flooding. These are engineering solutions. It's classic. This is how we think, um, and it's it's and very smart people are trying are are trying to deal with that. Uh, you could look at the same thing with the, the 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 plastic in the ocean. Millions of dollars raised to try to go out and engineer uh, a, a solution uh, to gather it all up in some way, which is really ineffective. Uh, hasn't really worked. Um, and what we don't do is one of two things. We don't go, instead of just trying to fix the problem, that we try to go back and fix the cause. Um, so the way to fix plastic in the ocean is to fix the plastic problem. Uh, a fossil fuel product, let's remember, it's a fossil fuel product. Uh, it can be recycled. Uh, but plastic recycling, which had its moment, now has eroded. Uh, and because it was all based on the old behaviors, you either ship it to China, who won't take it anymore, or you, uh, you, you, you don't create scale that's large enough to make it e economical viable for industry to recycle that plastic. Uh, but if you recycled every bit of plastic on Earth today you'd never have to make another piece of plastic again. So we're, it's that kind of, 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 of behavior that we're not doing. The other side of that is adapt, mitigate, invent, invent. That's what we do best. This is one of the great aspects or great qualities of, of the human imagination. We know how to invent things. Scientists are brilliant at inventing things. And we ought to be subsidizing them, for example, the way we subsidize fossil fuels. Only within the last 30 days, I believe, has there been an attempt by the U.S. government to stop subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. So we've taken our resources that belong to the people. We've subsidized them. We've given research and developed grants. We've given them tax exemptions. Um, we've done all these things to enable the fossil fuel industry, right? Um, we've, we're, and we're exhausting the supply. But what, you've, what that represents is probably the largest transfer of wealth from the people to the few in human history. Think about it. Coal, oil, gas. All plastic, all of these things based are, are based on a, uh, have, been, have been incentivized up until this very moment, long after the oil crisis, long after the smart money left, um, only because of these vested interests. And you see these companies today, even still, in the name of sustainability and conservation, environmental and ESG standards and all the rest, look look underneath and see what actually is happening. And yes. you know, yes, there's a piece. To yeah, I did a podcast with a gentleman uh, 
from Penn State, named Michael Mann, whose book, his newest book is called The New Climate War. Yeah. And it's about the information. It's, it's scrambling what you might call the signal to noise ratio to sow the seeds of doubt that we need to change or that there is any urgency in that need right. to change. Right. Right. Uh, Naomi Oreskes, who I've not met, wrote a wonderful book called The Merchants of Doubt, showing the analog between how the tobacco industry deflected attention yeah. away from the harm of cigarettes and how that's been adapted to the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. Do you yourself experience uh, what you might call vibrant opposition in the world of ideas from the things that you put out? <laughs> well, it may be that my voice is so tiny. Uh, it, they haven't heard it yet. They haven't heard it yet. But we'll, we'll, um, we'll work on that together. We'll work on that. But, <laughs> But my, 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 I think the, the the other thing to think about is so if you so in, if we're if we're in the in if we're in our inventive mode, and if we, we do acknowledge uh, that the old way of accounting for things we, uh, is a is a way to show on a corporate or a individual investor balance sheet that they, it's a it's that we're all engaged in a kind of false economy. And if you then look at what uh, uh, this new paradigm and you say, OK, if you're going to organize the world around the most valuable resource on Earth, which is which is the ocean freshwater continuum, then you have to start inventing ways to use that appropriately, not to corrupt it, not to pollute it, not to exhaust it. And if you do that, then other things start to happen that are sort of inevitable. Uh, there are kinds of these additional transformational outcomes. And so if you have a, if you take that as the premise, then suddenly the, the, the policies and the laws and the enforcement of those laws changes um, because you want to protect this new, this new uh, approach. You start uh, uh, addressing problematic forms of governance because you start thinking about upstream and downstream effect. Uh, I, we have independent municipalities along a river. The, the, somebody up here can put a, a chemical plant in and it will and throw their waste in the water. Nobody can stop them. However, it has terrible downstream impact on the community all the way down to the coastal, coastal resources where that river has become polluted. So in order to combat that under this new system, you move away from independent mentalities to regionalism and regional management, watershed management. Uh, and if you start doing that, you start making changes to the infrastructure based on the commonality of interest and the understanding that these things speak directly to meaningful work and public health and equity and social justice, all of these things that we talk about as problems we need to face in our society today actually could be um, addressed in a more creative way if we were to invent another way of, 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 of associate, organizing ourselves into new structures based on new behaviors that is all essentially gathered together in a strategy, the only strategy for the survival of civilization. So if you want to look at how we're going to do that, and you look at the ocean, you see that it is a climate regulator. You see that it is a heat pump. It is a massive storage uh, of, of, of energy that can be released in many different ways. Um, it is a huge uh, source of biodiversity and food uh, to feed the, the, feed the world. Uh, it is where we will find the cures to cancer and all diseases, even diseases we don't even know exist. Because in that biodiversity, Though we are already essentially building cancer cures on either direct use or synthesis of ocean organisms, of organ processes, uh, uh, ocean processes. So 
if if you if you really want to embrace a solution that could work that would work you need to say and you understand need to stand understand it urgently that nothing else matters and that we should that that the united states really doesn't even have a national ocean policy we say we do, and, and the Biden administration has put forth some interesting things, and they put some great people, great people into the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. But ocean policy extends beyond NOAA. It extends to land use, environmental protections, legal protections, health issues, you know, social justice, um, equ- ec- uh, problems of equity and access. Um, I'll give you a perfect example of that. Flint, Michigan. A, a, uh, close a, to my home. <laughs> a short term opportunistic political decision made by some politician basically destroys a community. And it is, it yes. is still not recovered. So suddenly the 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 the, That's right. the water That's is, right. is it comes back. It's sourced to pollution. There's immediate, immediate uh, data that shows that children' health is affected. The cr- uh, there's a hue and cry. Um, when they restore it to the the pure, the 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 the, uh, the pure supply, the only reason they really did it was that because there was a GM factory um, there in Flint that suddenly was complaining about corrosion in the parts. That the water they were using in the manufacturer was corroding the parts almost immediately, and so then they had to restore it back to the the, the the pure thing based on basically a political decision in response to a corporate interest, not to the fact that the children of Flint were ill, or that the property values in that in that in that city, heavily minority populated, were destroyed. And they still haven't replaced the yes. lead in the pipes. They still haven't addressed the problem yes. with any any degree yes. of compensation or reg- or, or regress. Uh-huh. I mean, restoration. It's You're winding ad- me up, man. You're winding me up because I, uh, as you know, I grew up in Detroit. Yeah. And I was there involved in some consultations around the Detroit bankruptcy as the Flint water crisis became known and understood. Being around the Great Lakes in a water crisis spun my head in terms of the relationship between values and value like I, you can hardly imagine but you can't imagine i know well, the, the, the people need to understand that the ocean begins at the mountaintop uh, and it descends to the abyssal plain so every drop of water that falls that evaporates from the ocean and goes into the water cycle the one scientific principle that almost everybody learns in grammar school right it evaporates it up, it goes up into the clouds, into the weather, it falls down as rain or snow, and then it comes right back down through the watersheds all the way to the ocean and recycles again. It's an absolutely glorious global system. And, for example, you can look at the Himalayas and see, that, which is now called the third pole, which because of evaporation and snowfall and all the rest of it, that 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 services... What is it? Seven Asian countries. Millions and millions of people rely on that water that descends down through all the farmlands and the tea plant and all of that into the rivers and then out into the sea. And that refreshment, that essentially that 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 descent of water then to be recycled again and again and again is the essence of how we survive. We are water you know our bodies are water um and so if we can't identify with this uh you 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 you, you're basically denying the fundamental uh element physical element in your body which in fact is that you're 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 denying yourself your soul life for you and everyone else and it needs to be 
urgent enough and un- understood well enough for people to understand that. And one of the tools that the World Ocean Observatory is developing, with, by the way, the support of the Smith uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute, is a virtual aquarium, which will allow for anyone, any age, anywhere, at any time, at no cost, to go into a virtual space that looks just like an aquarium, and they will be able not only to explore the deep sea, but the coastal zone, but they will also be able to spawn the nature of, of work, ocean work, and also cultural and spiritual resources. So there will be galleries within this, or modules or, 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 or exhibits within this virtual aquarium that demonstrates the hydraulic organization and depth of meaning and, and complexity and beauty of this water world. Uh, and to me, that's the most revolutionary thing we can do because it, 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 there's no price barrier. I mean, I love aquariums. I love what happens in aquariums in one way because it inspires in visitors, particularly children, a sense of wonder and reverence or at least an mm-hmm. awe in the face of nature. But if you follow a, a, a family of four after they've paid $120 for a two-day ticket um, and watch them go through even the, 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 the placement of the labels and the language in them is not really conducive because the, the, the parent needs to read it to the kid. And the parent doesn't understand it any better than the kid does. And so that the information is, it's awkward. There's an educational program. That's great. There's a touch tank. That's great. It costs $400 million or more to build one. It costs $40 million a year to run one. And all good. I want all of that to do. I want to drive using the virtual aquarium. I want young people and old people alike to essentially then go to those aquariums and learn more and learn about their yeah. and about their. And, and that's true all, you know, worldwide. This pathway, if you can create the virtual, what I'll call lily pad to jump on before going to the real aquariums all over the world, that's a fantastic, fantastic yeah. uh, Ju- Julie Packard, who is the, was the founder of Monterey uh, and has, has for, I don't know, 30 years, uh, you know, made that place magnificent. Um, uh, is one of the people I talked to originally uh, about uh, about the World Ocean Observatory, and and I went to see her, and I said, what you, "I'm not, I'm not this, I'm not that." But what do you think? She said, "Yeah, you should try it." The the interesting thing, though, about that particular place, and I I, I I've said this to them, so they've heard heard probably the person I told it to is long gone. But the point is that when you went into those cannery buildings, where that building, where that that uh, uh, mm-hmm. that aquarium is Where it's located. Yeah. up in the yeah. upper corner somewhere uh, there was a, a small exhibit on the cannery workers and it was the only social history that was evident in, in, the, in the building and when I went back the last time it was gone and that's Ooh. part of the problem the part of the problem is how do you relate what you're seeing in, in these places? It's true in museums too, by the way. It, you know, how do you relate what you're seeing to this to 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 these things outside of the pro- conventional way of looking at it? So, the the fact that is the aquarium is located in in buildings that in which workers and families grew up in California, uh, a kind of seminal industry uh, that was the soul of Monterey, long before the surfers and long before the second homes and long before all the tourists, that was the soul of Monterey. And suddenly that's missing. And that's part of the problem overall. It's the human dimension and relationship that we have to understand that the ocean is an enormous employer families, um, trades, uh, distribution systems, uh, all of these things are essentially functions of work 
that employ people and build family histories through generations. I'm sitting at this moment out on Long Island, and I have to recommend a book which uh, my children have heard from me read passages from, and the what's called East Hampton Marine Museum mm. uh, has done tours of it by Peter Mathiason called uh, Men's Lives. Men's Lives. And it's Great. about how what you might call the New York City resort community displaced the fishermen in yeah. order to have recreational beaches. Well, and, 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 uh, and the potato farmers, by the way, that are now all, you know, multi-million yeah. dollar building lots. But, but you're not necessarily going to staunch that history, but you need to remember mm -hmm. what it stood, what it was and what it stood for and how, what an extract from it, not just the value of the land, but the value of the intellectual property. The, uh, the value of the of the 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 psychological value, native peoples, indigenous peoples, who were the first first inhabitants of wilderness, um, uh, had to make that adaptation. And if you really you you can if you if you put yourself in close encounters with nature and and animals like your daughters are doing. What What's happening subliminally is in a kind of an identification with this, 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 this system, this, this, this force uh, that is, is, is uh, extremely powerful and extremely necessary for our solace. Why do people go to the beaches? Do they just go to hit little things back and forth over nets? No, they go there because they are face to face with raw nature, uh, they yes. they even want to go when it's not sunny. They want to go when it's wet. Right. When there's a storm, uh, they want to go out and yes. see what is one of the most dynamic, raw, rare environments left on Earth. Uh, by the way, free coasts means free access to anybody who wants to go and have that experience. And we can't deny that because we are denying an essential part of ourselves to ourselves and to others. It's very nourishing. People just experience such an uplift. That's what's happening here. This, the, the, this is the fundamental right of life. And that is the because we are working to essentially organize our, ourselves around the most essential nat nat natural system. And it's pervasive from, again, from the mountaintop to the abyssal plain, across all borders, all cultures, all classes. Uh, it affects us all the same way. And we, yes. we if, if we understand that and can work toward that, in our way, using our institutions, don't it doesn't mean that we have to become communists or you know, you know that. we can use our systems and, and 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 do that, but we just have to understand what the goal should be. And if we understand that the goal mm -hmm. now is survival, if people can really understand that, you know, one of the outcomes of the pandemic is with just how about six hundred thousand people dead. Uh, just here, um, doesn't that tell us something? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that say yeah. to us, you know, how vulnerable we are? And how did we yes. solve the problem? Yes. Well, we haven't fully solved it because, one, we have to find the cause, but two, we invented a response. Now, that's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. We invented a response mm -hmm. and we saved millions of lives by doing that. Right. Um, that's right and 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 you know if, if why would we why would we doubt science when science brought us uh, a solution to a problem that was killing our families day day after day uh, can we come out of that shouldn't we come out of that with a new perspective yes and a new perspective that well i think there's two things here i think there's two dimensions one is yeah. the science itself which we yeah. celebrate together the other is how it's refracted 
by the commodification right. of intellectual property rights or distribution systems to squeeze the vulnerable. Right. And that, uh, obviously, is playing out all over the world right now. Over and it, it's uh, unfortunate because it takes away from what you might call that bright light that you identified of science's ability to respond to challenge. The fact is that if we haven't figured out now how nature can essentially wipe us out in an instant by virtue of uh, communities washed away uh, by 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 uh, coastal hurricanes, uh, communities, uh, extreme weather patterns, uh, uh, essentially threatening nature, uh, nation states. I mean, Puerto Rico is a perfect example, still completely unrecovered from uh, 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 without help uh, 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 from from hurricane, uh, and the same thing is true in the in in Asia, um, uh, and and in, and slowly it seems that these values are reasserting themselves, hopefully in time, so that they essentially infect or infuse um, the, the 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 populist who then will vote the villains out, will vote the old way out. Uh, get rid of the old yes. man that's running our country, our, 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 not, not, not literally, but to, to essentially, there's an old thinking that's still... That An old needs, vintage, yeah. Yeah, old vintage, just get, we have to just turn it over, put it away, put mm -hmm. it in the attic, forget mm -hmm. about it, um, and, and, yeah. and, and, and invent our way forward. And my argument yes. is there's only one path to follow. I don't want to be didactic. I just think there's an impeccable logic that goes with it that because every place you look for a solution, you find it in this freshwater ocean continuum. You cannot find it on the land anymore because the land has either been has been exhausted. And and yeah. you know, we're gonna to have to live there and these systems whether we, uh, I mean, let's just take it, the, the most simple thing of all is fresh water. <laughs> you know, where is the world going to get adequate fresh water? You know, if you look at the Middle East and you look down at, at, at Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, what are those things? What's, what's, the, what are, what's going on? Is it just tribal warfare? If you look, this is the cradle of civilization, organized around the flow of water, water. from the mountains in Turkey you know, to the ocean. And, 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 and if a farmer can't, is, can't have access to water because of natural or political uh, reasons or religious reasons, whatever it is, what do they do? They fight. They give up. Or they become refugees. They try to go find a place where there is water. So refugees crossing the Mediterranean, I think, are, are basically fleeing the consequences of inadequate water. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you can look at, 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 at the source of, of Palestine and Israel. What, what happened? It's yes. the diversion of water from the, from, at the very outset, the diversion of water from the Jordan River that essentially was the basis for conflict that still exists in terms of what's happening in the East Bank and the yes. West Bank and all the rest of it in terms of control of wells. And, and By the way, I listened last night to a wonderful, wonderful lecture by a man who's a professor at Union Theological Seminary named Onery Hendricks, o, excuse me, Obery, O-B-E-R-Y, Hendricks. <laughs> and it was called The Kingdom of God and Political Economy. And it was all about Old Testament struggles over natural resources, natural resources. with yeah. God or his messengers continuously reminding us that we were responsible for the common good. And yeah. he was contrasting that with the kind of ethic that pervades our which might call economic religion, discourse today. Every religion, Rob, yes. has water yes. as a purification yes. piece. You know, if you're going to be redeemed, yes. You're being redeemed by by an, a water accountant. So I I actually yeah. I actually uh, my latest book is called Aqua Terra, which says that basically mm -hmm. one the first thing is that you know uh, this is Earth from space. It's not green. It's blue. It's the blue planet. It's the blue marble. People use it all the time. Mm -hmm. we're, we're we're misnamed uh, first. Um, 
But secondly, it's the one, again, the one thing that, that informs all our rituals. Every, every organized or disorganized religion has a water element, baptism, go down by the sea, purification, yes. all of these things which are, which are there to be our functions of redemption and the affirmation of self are water-driven. So why would we destroy it? And it's there for us in terms of, let's just take freshwater desalination. I mean, let's, yeah. let's face it. We are going to have to desalinate water from the ocean in order to provide yeah. adequate drinking water for public health. It's just yeah. inevitable. I want to emphasize something uh, that is very, what I would say, magnificent about you and your website. You have a series on World Ocean Radio of five to six minute little snippets each week. And why I think they're magnificent is they're so informative in five minutes that people get a huge, what you might call benefit to effort ratio. Well, thank you. It, the, 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 the connections are so viable and so obvious. So, for example, everyone hears about the Galapagos as this you know, biodiversity mecca. And the reason it's there is because the ocean currents essentially distrib distributed nutrients in such a way that they, they aggregated there. And so it was an enormous font and, and, and safe place for, for, for biodiversity development. Well, guess what? The same systems distribute poison, pollution, and that is affecting the Galapagos today mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. discharge from factories, uh, etc., or from air quality or whatever it is in places long, far away, but which through ocean circulation essentially comes and affects a place that one, one think was invulnerable, but it's not. That's the real key thing here. We are all equally vulnerable, whether you're rich or poor, whether you've got a gate in front of your house, or whether you have a you you have a abandoned lot next door. And we need to understand that that vulnerability has a solution, but it has to be equitable, and it has to essentially assert, uh, apply tools and assert an outcome that is real, that is workable, uh, and that will essentially, you know, save us from our own, our own devices. And I, I, you know, I don't want to beat it over the head, but there's only one. There's only one place to go. And I believe that policy, governance, and all the rest of it should be complete, that, that, that there should not be a single act in Congress that isn't somehow cognizant of its implication on the ocean. I don't care yes. what it is. That, that there, because I guarantee you, I can find a way that it connects. Somehow, somewhere, it connects. Yes, and there's another, there's an analogy I often used in relation to finance. Financial economists for a long time pretended that you could see the future, that you knew where we'd be in 30 years, and therefore the prices today just reflected that oracle-like awareness. There's a notion which John Maynard Keynes, a man named Frank Knight, put together, uh, or brought to the surface, it's called, what, what people like Donald Rumsfeld said, the unknowable unknowns. Yeah. They call it radical uncertainty. Yeah. What was interesting was in the debate for many years of deregulating finance, the what I will call demagogue-like oracle of finance could act like he could see the crystal ball of the future, or right. she could see the crystal ball of the future. Yeah. And it was it meant get the regulators out of our hair. All they do is make a mess of things. And it didn't acknowledge what you might call the collective protection we needed. And the collective protection that we needed was from the kind of calamities that we experienced in 2007 eight and nine that were very disruptive to the core of trust in our society and governance and expertise. But what I always did was I said, you've got to understand something. You can't know everything. 
But you can't get so afraid you go and hide in your bunk. You've got to continue to function. You've got to work with experienced people. You've got to learn. You've got to manage that uncertainty. You've got to manage your way through that fear. And as I'm listening to you today, I think that analogy applies to people, which you might call doing the ostrich or embracing the challenge that the World Ocean Observatory was designed to meet. How do we bring everyone out on deck in the storm under leadership like yours and other wise people from around the world and navigate so that we're back in a safe harbor? What will it take? How soon will it come? Uh, not soon enough. Uh, I, I think it's going to have to be a kind of, it's not evolution. Uh, I don't, uh, it, it has to be uh, revolution. I don't think it's revolution the other way because revolution sort of implies it's, it's still backward. Um, I, I, I think it's invention. I think we have to take responsibility for ourselves um, and apply what we know because we do know a lot uh, and uh, put it to work, but put it to work in a way that essentially uh, is based on different values, uh, you know, that is uh, justified and upheld by the by that knowledge, uh, create the structures necessary to make it happen, uh, and uh, based on those values, uh, and then act. Uh, people say, well, Peter, you're, how can you be optimistic? Uh, what, 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 what can you possibly do? And my argument is, uh, pick something. Just pick one thing. It doesn't even have to be an ocean thing. Pick a land thing. Pick whatever it is that you believe in the context of this future thinking matters enough for you to invest your time and energy and wisdom into that one thing. And then I ask the next person, and the next person, and the next person. And by the time we all get together uh, from the bottom up, right, we will have essentially invented something new. But we have to be informed. We have to understand the system. And the whole purpose of the World Ocean Observatory is to build a, a, a populist, democratic, freely accessible um, uh, uh, platform of knowledge and experience uh, that people can use to inform themselves to, that, to, the, to those actions. Um, and that's the brilliance of the inter Internet in the sense that you can actually – um, do that. I mean, the World Ocean Observatory is two people. Uh, we're reaching millions of people. We're, 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 our budget is hardly anything. If you look at the return on investment, uh, it's mag magnificent. There's no greater return on investment uh, in terms of public uh, of, of, of connection uh, through something, a simple tool but that has access worldwide to millions of people, and it can be tens of millions of people. And informing them and providing them with the information that, that contextualizes uh, natural systems, getting people to understand that this can be accounted for using, using numbers and defining value and justifying investment um, as good things, uh, that's the that's the outcome I hope for. Is uh, 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 and it, it and it starts it, it starts first inside here, and then it, it, in every act that that that, that you, one takes, um, and where how you invest your energies, uh, uh, and you know, uh, and and understanding that 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 as in all things there is a limit to in time and space. And, you know, we're smart enough to know where we are. We're also smart enough to know what we do, what to do. But are we smart enough to do it in time? 